This episode is brought to you by Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much by going to airbnb.co.uk forward slash host. So we're going to be talking about Civil War today. Mm. And in setting up just now for this show, James just took a call and I had five minutes to kill. We were all set up. I'd already gone through my notes. And I thought, you know what? I know nothing about the actual American Civil War. Yeah. Obviously, we never learn it. it only no. it's not in any curriculum I ever studied at school. It's just a complete... Because it's it's a, you know, it's a... Interna- you know, na- it's a national specific thing to. We what do what divorce, to beheaded, die, divorce, beheaded, yes. survive. and we That's also we, we had our own civil war as well. We did. Yeah. So um, I know I know the names. I know the Gettysburg Address, and I know uh, Lincoln. Yeah, slavery, Ulysses S. Grant, all of that. And that's about it. And anyway, so watch I, National Treasure. I know, just did Declaration a, of Independence. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, yeah. For, the, for the War of Independence. Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just, well, straight away, James, that's <laughs> correct. America. Uh, American, American history. Uh, but, uh, and also not to be confused with the War of 1812, where the British burnt down the White House. Did you know that? Heard of it, but I'm not. Heard of it. Heard of it. Heard of it. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, it's yeah, not terrible. There's horrible things happen. I know. We're like, yeah, I guess oh, history. But, it's just blood. But did you know death. they rebooted the Omen prequel? <laughs> yeah, so. let's do the podcast. Yeah. Um, yes. So we did a little deep dive just there. Did a ten minute Wikipedia session on the uh, civil, American Becoming Civil War. Such a history, Dad. Very interesting. Yeah, history is interesting. History yeah. is amazing. I, 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 it is no, interesting. I know, yeah. It is amazing. It's just funny. You're, I do love w- it. With age. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The more, yeah. The more I am, I will... Yeah. You'll get worse or better or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Depending on how you feel about I'll it. I'll get deeper into it. Oh, yeah. Any, anything to do with like, oh, wow, that's yeah. how they did that in that time. And that's yeah, it's brilliant. Specific, I mean, the older history gets, the less interested I am. I'm more of a 20th century man, really. Of course. I mean, they I'll stretch that. to the 19th, yeah. but... Do you still do that thing where, where someone says, oh, it was in the 16th century and your brain has to go, so that's not the, f- is that the yeah, 1500s? Every time. Yeah. Or the, yeah. Um, you were going to say? When? At the beginning of the show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't, um, I don't usually like to... I, I like to be uh, over, overall... Changing subject now. Changing subject, not America. Uh, overall, I like to be positive about... Fairly positive about the state of cinema and, like, is it dying? Oh, and I think, we, you know, we, we talk about this every single week of, like, oh, well, this film, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, it's changing. Yeah. Big screen, small screen boutique. Yeah. Where do the films come out? There's only a few instances where I look at a film and go, it's dead, isn't it? And that's when I see the trailer concept title for Godzilla X Kong. Oh, yeah. And I go, oh God, yeah, it's really yeah. dead, isn't it? No disrespect to that film. And if it is good and people have enjoyed made it, it's made, made a load of money. Um, I'm almost just like, God, this is really, this is it, isn't well, it? Bottom of the barrel, two, just smash two IPs together. There's the great thing, which was, uh, you know, the guys that do the fake board meetings. And he's like, okay, we got a Godzilla oh, yeah. Kong thing. Yeah. And he's like, what if we put Transformers in it? And he's like, you're fired, but write that down. That's <laughs> a great, that's a great idea. It's like, right, we did Godzilla V Kong. We've done Godzilla X Kong. What is going to be the next letter? <laughs> Godzilla Y Kong. What do you mean Y Kong? <laughs> that's so funny. If you, I don't know who that, also, the guys that do that. I've but. seen, I read one review that he, He'd, this guy had li- taken it too literally, the the X. He was like, so it's, you know, they've used X like Godzilla multiplied Kong. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's a brand collab. It's a, it means collaboration. Yeah. It means- Because they, you don't, you they don't actually take down it's, a greater evil. It's, it's just Godzilla Kong. You don't actually verbalize the X. You just say yeah, God, yeah. Godzilla Kong. Yeah. But, but it's interesting, this guy was like, they don't so much as multiply in this film as like crash together. And I'm like, you're reading it too literally. <laughs> You've thought about this more than anyone making it ever yeah, did. You've never yeah. worked on a brand brief, have you? Yeah, yeah. And also with those films, again, I've seen uh, one of them secondhand on a plane through someone else. You never else saw the it. original. Tw- not 20, 20, I've seen twenty fourteen. Yeah, yeah, but I feel like also that was like pre before they decided to make it into a whole thing, wasn't it? I feel like that. The only thing that shares with these ones is the design of Godzilla. Yes. It's Other so than true. that, it just feels like. But I feel like the entire world and all of its cities get destroyed in every one of these films. Yeah. How much more humanity is left? And they don't seem to be bothered by it. Again, I've not seen these films. Yes. But they don't seem to be bothered that Rio just gets uplifted. I guess Rio must be sacrificed. I mean, crush, you chose Rio is a huge city to wipe out as yeah. well. One of the most popular cities on the planet. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rio gets sacrificed to save the world from, you know, at least the rest of the world's intact, right? But, I, but then they get the next film, they, they're destroying cities all over. Like, yeah, but let, no let them fight. That's yeah. what he says, isn't it, in the 2014 one? Let the monkey and the lizard fight the bigger monkey and lizard. I was a bit disappointed by 
2014's Godzilla. Me too. I thought it looked cool, Halo Jump cool, all that Stylistically stuff. Stylistically tasteful. But um, it's pretty dour. Uh, pretty humorless. They killed Heisenberg off in the beginning, which I thought but was I, a mistake. But I, yeah, I, I, knew, I knew that was coming. Everyone was surprised, but I was like, he, it goes, you've got all those cast members, then it goes, and Brian Cranston. Oh, yeah. like, uh, he's there for the, but he's in half the trailer. He oh, is, they're gonna send us back to the Stone Age. <laughs> That's what he used to say. And then it's Aaron Taylor Johnson's movie. Yeah, yeah. And he's in it. He might not be Bond. I don't, yeah. <laughs> it's, when, a real sta- it's a real thing. Like, all came out. He's been offered the role of Bond. That was the story, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I wonder. And it just went. I still, see, so you and I are slightly different opinions. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you think that it's been slightly mishandled and that, like, you know, what's happened that they wanted to do it. But I think it's all part of a, very cynically, mm. all, all part of a, it's all planned. It's all planned. I'm not saying he's going to become Bond. Mm. I don't know either way. It's all part of the media circus to build up the hype, I believe. Because it was just zero to, to 100 miles an hour just with suddenly that story, be like, wasn't it? Be like this. Because yeah. like, oh. I know that t- traditionally the Broccoli's, the people in control of the Bond franchise, like to na- announce it themselves. They yeah. like to have the actor be announced. It's a whole thing. They get Daniel Craig on a boat in a suit, this wearing a life jacket. Yeah. And this is Bond. Loads of photographers. Mm. Next 10 years, this is your Bond now. Hmm. But I like Aaron Taylor Johnson. I think yeah. I think he'd be good. He's a good amount of fame, I think, to take on that role, but not too much. I really also only have such. I have a limited interest in Bond, really. Yeah. Film to film, yeah. you know. I take it on. I, You're I, there for it when it's there, but it doesn't occupy your mind. I would. I almost would go to see it more because we do the show than out of pure interest. Yeah. Really. I guess like the sort of aging dad of me is that every so often maybe. And if you're thinking like Roman Empire vibes, once a month, Bond slips into my mind. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, like, here's what what is. Gonna, you, I'm going to be a history do. dad and you're going to be a James Bond, Bond dad. Yeah. You're going to be so like, cringe. you're going to have collecting the little frame posters. And yeah, things, yeah. Well, yeah. did you know actually an octopusy that they did this yeah. thing in the Craig movies and this? I once worked at a charity event that was, um, it was James Bond themed and all of the of uh, auction items were famous relics and pieces and experiences relating to do with James Bond. They had this huge table. So like they had the new um, Safin masks from the, oh, new, from oh. the latest film. And then they just had like old signed records from these actors and thing mm. dates with, but Bollinger 007 sponsor. It was quite fun to see all these little trinkets yeah. and bits, uh, Aston Martin stuff. It's cool. Did you bump into something and knock it off the off, off its thing? Yeah, like, like, like a glass egg. egg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Who did this? No, we never we never got there. The assailant. Um, the cool, the one of the coolest days I've ever had for work was going to the Aston Martin factory. Oh wow! And yeah. they re-released, they remade, sorry, ten of the original Goldfinger Aston Martin <gasps> DB five. Don't, yeah. don't quote me on that. And I got to sit in this car which had the button and the, the guns that came out the, oh, the yeah. thing we i drove around and i didn't i was driven but i was filming in the in the passenger seat in that car for like two hours really and cool. i just got to film the the, the handle and, the and i don't care about kid, cars weren't you? it was amazing the most beautiful car ever. you know i don't Ten care about cars either there's sometimes yeah. guys were trying to talk to me about cars and i'm like whoa i'll be stopped you right there i know i know nothing I, I don't even think about what car i don't i don't i, I can drive but i don't own a car no I don't have a don't have a romantic relationship with cars at all. I, I like the idea of a Tesla because I like tech, and for me, that's like a gadget oh, that see. drives. Oh, uh, yeah. So if yes. I was to make loads of money, a car's the last thing I'd spend money on, but it would probably be a techie car. <laughs> I guess Cybertruck, but it could <laughs> be the most expensive car. In the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's 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 definitely the last thing I'd spend money on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'd be buying a nicer coat before I got a car. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I see your future. Just you, see you see that fur coat, fur coat, no car. Cyber truck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or just in like a horrible little, like the in between his car. Or oh, I look like Snoop Dogg in like a fur coat, but I'm squeezing it. You know all. that yellow and red car you pay money to go into as a kid that's on the side, yes. like every, or like you know the play. Yeah, that's the big version. Be coming out of the club with a cane when Pop Kitchen really takes off. In a oh couple yeah, of years, you know. Bum, 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 I drive up to my yacht, but just like pedaling like a Flintstone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, welcome uh, to episode one, two, three hey. of Pop Kitchen. Look at that for a number. Uh, Pretty uh, unique. Uh, uh, one, two, three, three four, four, five. five. Yes, yeah. Lou Bega. Yeah. And uh, welcome. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit groggy today. Yeah, yeah, so James is going to have to steer me a little. I'm a little Sorry. bit all over the place. Yeah. But welcome. We're going to be talking about Civil War, Alex Garland's new movie. Alex not the Garland, Marvel film. Not the Marvel film. No, just just Civil War. Posters everywhere. Yeah. The tube, the bus, Civil War. Yeah. Very apocalypse in, now inflected posters. Side note, I think of all the Marvel films, I'm happy to just stick on. I think Civil War's a really good shout. It's really fun. You've got loads of characters in there. Good action. Good film. Good fights. It matters. Mm. 
And it's like, yeah, I remember that moment. That was like fun before it all came yeah, together. I, I really liked it. I don't know. I've never rewatched it. I, th- I found Black Panther quite boring as a character in that. I found the whole True, sort he's of... he's not in it that much. Yeah, he, he's not in it that much. You're absolutely right. You're right, he's not in it that much. And I found just the whole Captain America sort of like, hey, no, I've got to stand up for what's right. I'm just like, <laughs> someone should have died in that movie. I've, always said I, that. I've, I've said this many times. Rody, Rody should have died. died. There should have been consequences to the heroes fighting each other. And he fell and I was like, oh, great. Imagine how pissed off Tony Stark would be if, if, if all that killed Rhodey. Yeah. And then he just lost the use of his legs and then just got some super legs. Nanotech. Um, and it's not like he had a huge role to play in Avengers where he was needed. No, no it just, it just wears a big suit. Consequences, anyway. So we're going to be doing Civil War. <laughs> we're and also film. going to be reviewing Ripley, the yes. new Netflix TV series. The talented Mr. Fame. Yeah, yeah of oh, oh, the talented Mr. Fame. Well, <laughs> yeah. actually, there's, there's, there's... Not the, the, not the uh, Ripley alien no. prequel. Oh, no. But I'm sure it's coming, by oh, the way. Oh, yeah, that, yeah that actually, yeah. We're actually surprised we've not got a Ripley spin-off <laughs> yeah. prequel series, whatever. I guess it's so Sigourney, like, who are you going to... Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, they, 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 they do it. Do it. Yeah, they, they, yeah, what are we talking about? Of course, yeah. they'll find a way. They'll yeah. find a way. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, uh, great news series. James and I uh, have mm. watched. James watched all of it. I've yes. watched a bit of it. Yeah. Um, and then our bonus this week. Of course, guys, you can always rely on us to have more content than you can deal with. Yeah. We've got a bonus coming out this week where James is going to be talking about... The first Omen. The, uh, remember the Omen from the 70s and yeah. the reboot, uh, remake in yeah, the remake. early noughties? They brought out shot a new one. shot remake, basically. The first Omen now. This is the first Omen. This is the prequel. With Bill Nye. Bill Nye, uh, Charles Dance. Is Francis McDormand in it? No, no. Ralph Innocent's in there. Oh, yeah. Ralph Innocent's got a wonderfully oh, oh, yeah. scratchy, deep, scratchy voice. scary voice. Yeah, oh, shit. He's a real exposition character oh, in yeah. this. Thomas like, did no. thee witch thee? Yeah, he's uh, for the son of the devil to cast a shadow across the world. You're like, nice. yeah, Ralph Innocent. Go, nice. Go get that. And we're also going to be talking about the Netflix film Scoop, Scoop. which is about the Prince Andrew Newsnight interview um, which Prince Andrew knows. runs a gelato parlor. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no, it's not, no, that. not that kind, not that kind of scoop. <laughs> so look out for that later in the week. But we, you know, whatever you're watching, basically, we've got it covered this week. We're, we're covering the main stuff. James, shall we start the show? So we start the reviews, and then after which we'll do some emails and play some games. Also, I know we say this, but welcome everyone. Oh yeah, welcome, well, well, welcome back. And yeah, if welcome. it's your first time listening, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Let's start. Hey guys, this is a quick message brought to you in partnership with our friends at Airbnb. So George, I just got back from a nine day trip the other day. Yeah, you do go away a lot. Sorry, I do know it uh, kind of derails production slightly, but um, work or otherwise, I do enjoy getting a bit of winter sun. Mm. I do enjoy getting out of the sort of dark, wintry London months. Yes. And I will be going away again in a few weeks (laughs) with my family. But, um, you know, I was actually speaking to my older sister about this. And for the last two years, she hosts her flat on Airbnb every time she goes away. And it got me thinking like, why don't I do this? It seems like a really easy thing to do. I actually went to go and check what other flats in my area were going for. And I realized my home was actually worth more than I thought. This just feels like a no brainer. So if you were to go away now, you could host your flat on Airbnb. And when you come back, you made a little bit of extra pocket money. Yeah, so it goes towards the next holiday. Yeah, smart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I've never, thing. I've never hosted on Airbnb, but I have stayed in an Airbnb several yeah. times, and uh, there have been a few times where I'm thinking the host is the same age yeah. as me. Why am I not doing what they're doing? We should be doing. We this. should be doing this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just feels like something that would really fit into my lifestyle. But mm. you guys could find out how much your home is worth by going to Airbnb.co.uk forward slash host. So Ripley, based on the Patricia Highsmith novel, Towns yeah. Mr. Ripley, but also she has a series of novels, five Ripley yeah. novels. And obviously the most famous example we can hark back to is the original Talented Mr. Ripley movie from the late 90s with Jude Law, Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow. Which you and but I hold in very high regard. High regard. I love rewatched it two Christmases ago, completely re-fell in love with it again. And just, yeah. uh, it sort of solidified itself as one of one of my top films. I agree, I agree. And I think, uh, yeah, it's definitely up there in my favourites. I think it's one of the most stylish films ever, I think. Impossible not to just fall madly in love Brilliant. with Jude Law. You know, he was two years younger than us when he made that. Excuse me while I Shot be that. sick. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a re- And they made that film for, it was a tight budget. And they were doing like 14 hour days. They were all exhausted. And mm. every night Matt Damon would go up to the, his, he was actually quite separate from the cast because he would go up to his hotel room and go on the cross, uh, on the treadmill for six, like uh, run six miles on the treadmill really every thin. night because he needed to make himself look like Jude Law, oh the whole thing he needs to slim himself down yeah. as much as possible. Because Matt Damon, yeah, you know, he, he's not he's not overweight, but he's he has a heavier build. He's a heavier build. Law, he's yeah. a heavy build. Um, that's most famously there, but also there have actually been several Ripley iterations from the other Ripley novels. There was actually Vin Vendors we talked about recently oh, yeah, yeah. from Perfect Days. Should he we made... close the window? Because I think with the power tools, honestly, it's spring and they just get all the power tools out. And then top window as well. 
So, so Vin Vendors, who we talked about yes. recently, he made a Ripley movie in 1977 called The American Friend with Dennis Hopper playing Tom Ripley. Very right. different. All these iterations, very different styles. That uh, was based off of the third Ripley novel. Then they made a Ripley movie in 2002 with John Malkovich called Ripley's yeah. Game. Yeah. He played Ripley then. And then there was apparently a terrible uh, 2005 Ripley movie called Ripley Underground where Barry Pepper played heard of that. Tom Ripley. Barry, Barry Pepper is the sniper in uh, Saving Private Ryan. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, but... Great name. <laughs> but a dormant franchise from very popular novels. Patricia Highsmith also was a very interesting writer. She Considered one of the great crime absolutely. murder writers. Absolutely. And she wrote this and uh, Strangers on a Train. Oh, she also wrote Carol, the, 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 the story that would become the oh, movie yeah. Carol uh, called The Price of Salt. Anyway, the latest iteration is now out as, as an eight-part series. Eight-part series episodes like 45 minutes to an hour a piece um i think like you know we, as you said we hold we hold the talented mr ripley from 99 yes. in very high regard. i want to see you yeah, 99 98 yeah in really high regard i'm sort of when i heard that they were doing a uh netflix miniseries adaptation looking very stylistically very differently i think i was a little bit like oh don't touch it yeah, that's yeah. one of my films i think it's near perfect yeah. with beautiful actors who do the job really well iconic Totally iconic. Um, watched it recently, so it's fresh. I'm mm. not sure. You know, even though you've got great, uh, great ingredients in there, like Andrew Scott, who I think can do no wrong at the mm. moment. I was a little bit like, oh, I'm just not. I'm not ready to jump into mm. this. Um, based on much more based on the novel than it is sort of a remake of any film yes. or thing, the thing that we've seen before. Um, if for those of you who don't know, Ripley is in this series. We find him as a sort of nomadic stranger living in New York, a scammer. He is someone who you know steals letters from dental practices and falsifies letters mm -hmm. to them, claiming that they're past due on rent, trying to mm -hmm. cash checks in banks. He's a scammer. He's an enigma, like um, a, almost a very very sinister. Catch me if you can. Yeah, <laughs> totally. There is a bit of like that sort stealing of like envelopes to get them out. The numbers. Off of things yeah. and um, one thing that I sort of will go on to talk about later and what this series just does so well is the capturing of uh, letters, uh, uh, signing, mm. typewriter things, everything about that is mm. so beautifully captured in the, in the telling of this story mm. and information that's passed uh, in, in the 1960s, uh, 50s? 60s. 60s. Uh, so he is tasked by the father of Richard or Dickie Greenleaf, a wealthy upper class middle man, middle class man, uh, to bring his son home from it Italy. Uh, Richard Greenleaf, he's played by um, Johnny Flynn. Johnny Flynn in this in this series has been living in Italy, sort of beyond his means in a huge house. He doesn't really have any direction. He's painting, he's pursuing art, but basically his father's like, look, it's time for him, mm. time for him to come home. Um, and so he. Basically, flies uh, gets a gets on a boat to Italy. We don't see how. We don't see I how. I assume he would later. Have probably got a boat, but we don't know. Goes to Italy and fa and tr travels all the way to this part of town and slowly introduces himself to Dicky. Pretends to be someone who is in, lived in parallel to his life from 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 New York and slowly entwines himself into Dicky's life. He's also. Uh, got a girlfriend called Marge, played by Dakota Fanning, who's, I think, really good in this yeah, uh, and does yeah, really well. And sort of, she's very suspicious of him and he's not upfront with the reason he's there initially. Mm. But all of a sudden, this obsession grows to mimic the life of, of, of yeah. Dickie and sort of become part of him. There's an infatuation, an mm. obsession, a slightly subsexual, mm. um, like he's wearing his clothes and posing as him. And all of a sudden, it completely departs from from what that what he was originally tasked to do, and I think also and, you know, yeah. do stop me, but um, it's also this like very much like class based thing where you know when we first meet Tom, yeah. Tom Ripley in New York, he's in a crappy apartment, where, where, you know, really making ends meet by doing these scams, yeah. and suddenly he finds himself in this position of luxury around people with wealth. He absolutely, uh, you know, Dicky represents, it. yeah, absolutely idolizes everything that Dicky represents, and and. And also is a touch of envious as well. Yeah. And there's this aspirational element to him. And he, he realizes- Culture that, and art and knowing things about- Exactly. And he's almost like he arrives in Italy, meets Dickie and realizes, he's like, hold on, this is a great thing going on there's here. There's levels to this. Yeah. yeah. I need yeah. to make sure I can continue Yeah, this. you almost say, uh, this is sort of, apologies for the drilling outside, it's powerful. Uh, there's almost this thing where like he he's 
pretending to elongate his stay and sending letters back to Richard's father being like, oh, you know, that money you sent, would you mind sending me a bit more mm. so I can stay yeah. here? Because anyone, anyone would. So the first thing to notice about this is that I was slightly thrown by the difference in the, the age of the cast members attached to the age of certainly the talented Mr. Ripley yes. film and obviously the actual characters as they were written. As f from, what I'm, uh, from what I'm aware, the characters in this novel, I think Dickie's meant to be in his mid-20s. Yeah. And Andrew Scott is 47, um who's looked meant to be a similar age because they grew up together. And uh, Johnny Flynn is, I think, in his early 40s, yeah. which got, sort of threw me a little bit because I was like, I think there's something about the young passion and yeah. flair of those characters to me is distinctive of people who are in their 20s. And also the fact that Dickie is being sort of wayward in Italy, lounging about is a very kind of 20s totally. immaturity it's kind of, it's, you see that as someone characteristic in their 20s. When someone does it in their 40s, it's kind and of. And a father telling his son who's in his 40s to come home and. Yes, like, you, how always, old is that slightly father? Strange. Yes, I, is. I've always found that slightly strange. And I think that the, the series probably wants you to imagine that they are 10 years younger, even yeah. though the characters are meant to be 15 years younger. And don't get me wrong, Angie Scott, we've talked about this uh, on the show impeccable. before. 47 looks fantastic. When what, he was doing promo for all of us strangers. Skin, everything just. I know he's looking great. I he mean, is. no, to be ages, more yeah. just like I am thrown by the totally. thematic uh, differences between people in their late thirties and in their twenties. That did did sort of throw me. The other thing about this is that it is a noir black and white mm. adaptation of this. And um, uh, who was it who made it? It was Robert Elswit. No, Stephen Stephen Zylan, who's the director, who's commented on the fact that he chose to shoot this in black and white. He said, "When I read the book, it had a black and white photograph on the front cover, and to me, for the rest of the time, I only pictured this this series in black and white." And you and I have seen the film, which is gorgeous to look at. Yes. You almost can't imagine sucking the color yeah. out of that out of that uh, whole whole story. But and, 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 and in the in that film as well, it's like you know. The red of the Campari is mm. jewel red, ruby red. The blue of the sea is aqua Jude blue. Law's tan skin. Yeah, the blonde. It's just it shimmers like a film, totally. film photograph. Totally, and you, you're realizing that this is going for something completely different. We obviously start, you know, in New York, and you're shooting the city in this very gothic noir style, yeah. um, and it goes on to basically really define itself as a totally different telling of this story. Um, so. It's shot by Robert Elswit, who's yeah. shot There'll Be Blood, Magnolia, Nightcrawler, and, and many others. It's absolutely yeah. spellbindingly he's, gorgeous. He's a real heavyweight uh, cinematographer. He's great. I, uh, I, I just thought that, you know, looking at this, you immediately think this is a deeply gothic, black and white, noir, Hitchcockian treatment yeah. of this story. It's so definitive. It immediately, I think, dif differentiates itself from that Completely film. Completely different. Go I, th I think it's great, by the way, this yeah. series. And it goes on to prove that it is so deserving its right to exist mm. and to tell this story in a way that I don't think that film even, even touched. That film yeah. still stands an incredible film, but I'm yes. so glad this version exists. Um, yeah. It's about eight 45 minutes to an hour long episodes, but you could watch it through like a film. I watched this in two sittings. I could not stop looking at it because it just mm. effortlessly flowed. Wow. I became completely enraptured in Ripley as a character. And one thing that I found interesting about it is I think in the film, as audience members, you, we all fall in love with Dickie. We're longing for Dickie to notice us and to bring us in. And you're, you, you, like Ripley, become obsessed with Dickie. And in this series, I found that that's not what this series was trying to do. I don't think Johnny Flynn should necessarily be compared to Jude Law's performance because they're so different. Mm. But to me, the obsession in this series was with Ripley. Mm. You're meant to be obsessed with his every move because yeah. I never really got... And I think I think I, I'm a sort of that, I think Johnny Flynn's performance did slightly leave me lacking when I'm watching this because he didn't he didn't sort of entice me. I didn't understand why yeah. I wanted to obsess with this character. I didn't fall yes. in love with him like I did with Jude Law. I actually think he's a little mm. bit. Sometimes his delivery was well, you know, you gotta. What are it's you gonna do tomorrow? Flat, it's a little flat. He's very still, and I, I, it's not the same performance. But mm. it doesn't have the same. I'm not in love with Dickie in this. I think that. I was going to say, I, I noticed something about it. So just for the record, I've only seen two episodes. Yeah. James has seen the, the entire eight. But of the two episodes I've seen, I noticed that in in its different aesthetic, stylistic approach, the sort of when Dickie and Tom first meet and the whole interaction, it's framed much more as sort of awkward and mm. stilted and cold. Whereas just, just for comparison's sake, in the, the film version, it's much more romanticized, energetic, yeah confident and you see Matt Damon as Tom Ripley really turn it on turn yeah. on the charm and what I noticed at first is that there wasn't actually a clear demarcation between the Ripley that we see in the shadows and the Ripley that's interacting with yeah. um, Dickie it's sort of the same awkwardness 
So I first of all, I agree with you. I'm like, what is there about Dicky that's so enticing, other mm. than the material and the yeah. sort of you know the, the, the handsomeness of him to to to, to, to the wealth Ripley. and everything we exactly. Said before, yeah, but also what is so charming about Ripley to Dicky for him to want to continue to hang out with him because mm. there's I noticed uh, this sounds like a criticism more than more than I actually because there's the homoerotic element of it yeah. as well, which is unclear and left vague. But like when we f- that first interaction when they first meet. Before you know it, they quickly cut and they're walking up the steps to the villa and they're having a drink sort in the villa. Them for a coffee. And I'm sort of thinking, oh, hang, what's happened there? You've basically, Dicky, you've met someone that you don't actually remember who says, who claims to know yeah. you. Uh, I, I suddenly find you, you, you've got to the point where you're, you know, having drinks together. Maybe because I guess you're uh, uh, another politeness. American, just out yeah. of politeness, another American. But I'm thinking, I don't see the charm of. Ripley, I don't see Ripley working his charm or conversely, Dip, Dickie working his charm on Ripley to the same extent. Yeah. Not a major problem, but I did I did think that. I was like, why are these two people attract, you know? Yeah, anyway. yeah totally. And, and structurally this, this, obviously, but in sort of how the story plays out happens very differently. In the original or in the movie of Talents and Mr. Ripley, yeah. the turning point of the plot takes place about halfway through, maybe yeah. almost two thirds of the way through. Whereas in this series, that happens way earlier. Uh. And this series really comes alive after that moment. I and I think comes because a good series that I was into to just being unable to stop watching wow. and just taking off. And the devil is in every single detail that I'm so glad was played out to me so yeah. slowly. The pacing is slow. And you notice that when you first watch episode one, but that all of a sudden doesn't matter once you start getting into it because every brush stroke, every flick of autograph and signature, every letter open, every typewriter key yeah, yeah. is given detail and it becomes so clear as to why that detail is so important mm. later. And it's just scintillating yeah. and evocative and just brilliant. I, I, I cannot shower this series with more mm. compliments for how much joy it gave, gave me. Gorgeous to look out. The, the details of the web of lies that is created yeah. as this thing goes on, it's just so captivating to see play out. And what I really like about this series, and it's true for the film as well, is that as audience members, we are given access to all the information. We know exactly what happened, we saw what happened, mm. but we've seen all the truths mm. play out. And we're just watching great minds trying to figure out what actually happened. And that's so entertaining. Yeah. Watching them go down, uh, you know, dead ends and then coming back, getting the wrong information, but realizing yeah. what was true. It's so fun to have a scene. It's like watching a great poker match. You know how yes. everyone else, you know what everyone else's cards are and you're watching them yeah. figure out. It's just brilliant. The cinematography yeah. choosing to go noir, black and white. It, it, when you shoot black and white, you get to really work with contrast and they do it so well in this film. I always felt like everything was on the brink of discovery. Everything's on the edge of truth, the edge of death, shining a light on what really happened is always just mm. an edge away. And there's a specific scene later, which really uses shadow and contrast. And you get a really clear sense of why they've chosen mm. to hide things and show things. Um, everything that is beautiful in this series, yeah. whether it was a person, a place, a relationship, mm. eventually gets muddied, disgusting, and brutalized. Mm. And again, contrast of beauty mm. and horror. Andrew Scott is the best actor working today yeah. after this series. He's completely spellbinding. Do you know what's interesting about Andrew Scott is that he was a supporting actor for so long and wonderful, yeah. and amazing, amazing, and also a very accomplished theater actor, as we've said before. And he's had two leading roles back to back now this yeah. year with all of us strangers and now this and it's like yeah well, like it's so obvious of course he sh- should be yeah. the leading man of things because he's just so interesting yeah um i'll say when you said about the pacing i i agree i think it's deliberate as is tom ripley it's deliberate and meticulous because tom ripley what makes him such a compelling character even though he is sinister and nasty he is very smart yeah. and you love as an audience to follow smart people and to see what he's they good do. at his craft his craft just happens to be conning and scamming people yes. and watching that is so interesting um i think that uh, i i just yeah you get totally hooked in even and that's what makes you squeamish because highsmith originally i guess was pulling you in with the, this incredible craftsmanship of ripley's character and then making you feel awkward and, and uncomfortable for, for Almost what happens rooting for them in a way yeah exactly yeah. He, he, that's why he often gets referred to as like an anti-hero in a yeah. way um and i love that i would say that um everything so far that i like about ripley is everything i didn't like about saltburn and I think this is very important to bring up yeah. because we just went through Saltburn fever, which was so big and so like, oh my God, you know, everyone obsessing about it. And like uh, everyone who finds out that I do a film podcast who are yes. very casual film viewers go, oh yeah, what do you think of Saltburn? It's yeah. a question I'll get asked four, four times a day if someone finds out I do a film podcast, which is really interesting. Yeah. But anyway. so, so on the one hand, you have Saltburn, which... T- 
took heavily, more than, it, more than was respectable from the talented Mr. Ripley. And Saltburn, Saltburn's whole aesthetic approach was excess. And it was excessive to the point, because it, I, I felt it was excessive because it had, it didn't, it was excessive uh, in, in lieu of any depth, right? Yeah, now, and, and I think implied I said, depth that didn't, wasn't exactly. really fleshed out. Now, as an aesthetic approach, excess is fine. I, like I said at the time, I, beautiful, I like the kind of trashy excess of the late noughties, that's, that's fine. But when you c- compare to something like Ripley, which is so stripped back, black and white, mm. and deliberate and focused, I'm like, I don't need to see Andrew Scott lick Dickie's bath no. water to know exactly he's obsessed, uh, he's obsessed and exactly his feeling. It goes everything about Ripley is they, they are complete polar opposites in the way they are executed. Totally. Even though they share such DNA, you don't need to use color. Yeah. You don't need to you know have all this grotesque excessiveness to really get us rooted in the nastiness of the story. As well as that, there are like the cameras, and you'll notice this as you keep on watching it and you return to the same environments. They they decided where the camera would be and what the angle would be for that place. Mm. And they stuck at it. And when they went back, the camera never moved. So mm. you know, you know, just in the first two episodes, the long stairs that yes. go all the way up. So there's the camera that always stays in the same position. But when different characters in different situations with different stresses mm. and moments of the day go through, you notice the difference because the camera hasn't told you exactly what, what to look yeah. at and it's used so well later on when Ripley's in an apartment and there's certain things that need to be hidden and shown and certain characters can or can't see exactly what's happened mm. and you realize how genius the use of the camera being definitive and decisive and staying at the exact same place and it's just you, you I feel like I know all of these spaces so well already and I, yeah. I know exactly where was what and what was hidden and, yeah. and it's just decisive and, and clear. And yes, you need to take your time to do that, but I'm so glad that over that amount of time, yeah. um, it, it, it did it. It's, it's, it's really well done. Um, I just also want to say the guy who plays the inspector, who is Maurizio Lombardi, plays Inspector Ravini late in the second half of the series, I thought was fantastic. Mm. It felt like watching a, uh, an early Christoph Waltz performance or discovering oh, Christoph wow, Waltz. Right, yeah. I just thought, brilliant, the detail. And again, just like letters and watching a great mm. mind try and unlock something and i also want to give a shout out and I, i'm sorry i can't name the actors but every single hotel receptionist desk yeah, clerk yes, yes. in this entire series is just phenomenal and it, whether it's the guy who runs the post office or just all of these people that uh and as i said before the exchange of information yes. and sending of messages is so pivotal to how yeah. everything happens in this series mm. and um the detail that goes into the keys and the the forms for the ferry, just all of those actors, there's no such thing as a small part. These yes. guys just turned up in the best way, whether it was the, the very expensive Corinthia mm. or the dingy, gross back alley hotel in Rome, all of them were just phenomenal yeah. and just brought those extra scenes alive. Uh, the what, highest praise from me. And just the way also about what it's shot, it's so clear, it's it's drawn, particularly in the, in the New York sequences, but it's so heavily informed by street photography yeah, uh, totally. in the 1950s, you know, deep black and white, yeah. like a life magazine kind of. Um, 100%. What's the name? Uh, not Vivian Mayer. It'd be a Vivian Mayer, but also, um, oh God, there's, there's a American, very famous American. I will come back to me, the name of an American yeah. street photographer from the uh, 50s and 60s. And it's very much like that, slightly skew angles when yeah. he's getting the train, the, the underground. Oh, All of it is heavily informed and stylized. Re- by, like, really like street wonderful photography rules of that time. composition, diag- and then, leading lines, yeah. natural spirals, rule of thirds. It's all yeah. meticulously designed. And, and then when it gets to Italy, it's like it takes sort of traditional... Uh, travel photography, uh, a travel eye, and just slightly makes it a bit more yeah. sinister. You know, slightly off kilter. If you you take the leading lines of a staircase, and that, if you just oh. slightly pitch it the other way, oh, this suddenly becomes very threatening and imposing. So. And almost like you get to Italy coming from New York, and you think, God, I can't believe they suck the color out of this. But mm. once you're in, it, you know what it's like? It's like getting into a bath. The first time you jump in, you're like, oh, I'm not so sure. It's not sure of the temperature here. But once you soak yourself oh, in yes, this series. Yeah. It's great. I think uh, if I am to criticize it, I think it maybe overstayed its welcome by an episode. Mm. It had it, it builds and it crescendos, and I, just, I as I said, I couldn't stop watching it, and I almost thought you should have just wrapped this up a little bit mm. sooner. But because I had such a good time with it, I'm so glad I've seen it. Mm. And I think you and I have been very. Um, quick to criticize or we, we get quite sort of down on thinking that uh netflix could be guilty of commissioning mm. content that has to immediately grab your attention and needs to be like second screen friendly and needs to like you know mm. we don't get the kind of long drawn out detail oriented series that we hope but i'm so glad 
this exists because yes. it's so once you start watching this all of those concerns about being able to pay attention being able to sort of sustain you all those things just all those concerns fall by the wayside mm. once you start watching really high quality tv shows yeah and uh, just i can't give it high enough praise it shoots to the top of netflix original series for me and what's really bizarre at the moment it's got a sort of like mixed reviews and i'm like i can't don't why, people don't know a good thing when they see it. I started it thinking like, oh, is it a bit too over stylized? And I was like, no, this is no, this is really perfect. good. This um, is really, really good. Diane Arbus. Diane Arbus was the name of the photographer I oh, meant from nice. the 1950s. Um, but yeah, Ripley, we're big fans. We uh, And it's great because we, uh, we, we are able to compartmentalize and love this TV series over here and still love the original film yeah. from the and, 90s over there. And I, I, I'm very happy to, if you told me next Christmas we're going to watch The Towns of Mr. Ripley, I'd so happily do yeah. it. But I could I could actually see myself two, three years down the line rewatching this. this series. There are so many details well, I want to rediscover. Uh, if, you can, if you can answer this in a non-spoiler way, do you yeah. think we will get more Ripley? Are they going to do the other novels? Because there's would, five novels. I would love them to keep going. If they can, if they can recreate the magic they did in this and do, do more adventures of mr ripley yeah i would well, love it i would absolutely love that so have you friends guys... at netflix listening just just do it <laughs> oh i think just if they need they to hit they'll do it oh, oh, great. Do you know what? we if you this does actually help stuff get commissioned if you like if you watch this on netflix and you like it do give it the double thumbs yeah because you need to tell netflix that they should keep making stuff like this. we heard this is like really important it's really important so stuff. double like it double like the stuff you like on netflix um Anyway, that was Ripley. Let us know what you think if you've seen the show. Do you agree with us? Do you disagree with us? Send your thoughts into hello at pulpkitchenpodcast.com. And if you do find episode one or two a bit slow... I know this is like a cliche of a good series, but please stick with it. Yeah. It's really worth it. And it it just comes alive in its in its middle section. Yeah. It's top, top quality. Yeah. So let's do Civil War, the latest film from Alex Garland. Yeah. Um, Ex Machina, Annihilation, Men... And now, Civil War, which could be his last film as director. He said, no. <coughs> oh, he said in an interview that he, he doesn't plan to make any other films as a director in the coming oh, wow. years. He's historically it, a writer, wrote... Uh, 20 yes, 28 years later. And, um, the Beach. The Beach. And Dread. Yeah, I think so. And um, uh, maybe Sunshine, I think. With, he collaborated yeah. a lot with Danny Boyle. Yes. And then he kind of branched off and became a director. But he's now said that he finds directing just very difficult, very, I mean, you can find his quote on, online, but very sort of draining and he really doesn't get a, doesn't find it as, um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> he doesn't find it as fulfilling and as joyous as, as, he, as he does. And he could have, he will still write. Um, he is, 28 years later, is in production. Him re-teaming with Danny Boyle. He's going to be writing that nice. and Killian Murphy playing yeah, in, in the role. It's low hanging fruit that one. Like, that means it's now he's Oscar winner. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, Civil War, though, the, the fourth film from Alex Garland. He also made a TV show in 2020 called Devs, which I, I didn't watch. But um, um, Civil War. <coughs> George just inhaled some granola in, in the break. The magic of editing <coughs> can't, can't hide your. Oh. <laughs> Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> so, Civil War begins with an address from the President of the United States, played by Nick Offerman in this. Great. And in his speech, he says, he basically describes how the US is in a state of civil war Mm -hmm. against the secessionists of California and Texas, as well as some Florida secessionists, which seem to be breaking away for a different reason and in a different state. And in this presidential address, he is saying... We've won a decisive victory, one of the best military campaigns ever. The, the enemy is on its last knees, and we are close to de- defeating the, ses- the secessionists from the Union. Is it secessionists? No, no, secession. To, to secede, secede got is you. different to succeeding got something. You, got you, got you. Um, and we then cut to the sort of the main fray, and what we're realizing is what the president has said is actually not telling with what the reality is. It seems that the Western forces of California and Texas are making very strong advances. And the equally the Florida, the Florida Alliance, I think that's what it is, uh, is also making gains. We follow in Civil War um, a, a band of photojournalists and well, journalists and photojournalists together. And I, and I should begin my review of Civil War by saying, it isn't the film you think it is. Okay, right. that's really important to say because I think, I think this film might catch a lot of people off guard with its focus and what it's intent. This film is called Civil War. It's being marketed as a war film. 
very Apocalypse Now theme sort of posters. Helicopters. Helicopters. helicopters that shot the not in the film, you know. Really? The, the close-up of the Empire, um, the Empire State uh, uh, torch with snipers in there. That's not in the film. How interesting. This is actually much more a film. Because there are bits of it that look like Modern Warfare 2 when they nuke the White House. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There was in the, sorry in the trailer. There's there a are shot. elements, but like really, uh, this is a film, film much more interested and focused and centered on journalism okay. and photojournalism. Um, we follow Kirsten Dunst, Kirsten, not Kirsten, by the way. I know that because Tom Wilkinson said it in an interview on radio in, on the radio ten years ago. And when they Kirsten Dunst was at the screening I was at, and when they introduced her onto stage, they said, "Please welcome Kirsten Dunst." So Kirsten, not Kirsten. There you go. Kirsten Dunst plays a, a renowned war photographer. Um, who's been sort of seasoned and embattled and kind of numb to the, the conflict around her. She is partnered with um, a journalist uh, played by Wagner Mora from Narcos, who, you know, who played Pablo Escobar so brilliantly, Brazilian yeah. actor, um, Wagner Mora. And when he turned up in this, I was like, yes! I was like, you're a great actor, mm. but we don't see enough of you in the English-speaking film world. Yeah. Like, it's great to have you in this, and he's really, really good. Nice. Um, they... they at the beginning of the film are at a hotel in New York. And uh, New York is a place where it's still functioning as a city, but there's very much an armored presence. There is civil discontent. There is well, a, 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 a brawl outside a water truck for rations. So, you know, society is being frayed. Um, at the sort of press center at this hotel, where they, are, they also sp uh, speak with um, a much older journalist played by Stephen McKin McKinley Henderson. People will know from June Part One, Lady Bird. He's a he's almost like a representative of the kind of old uh, journalistic guard, you know, the kind of all the president's men type of journalism. They meet a much younger and budding photojournalist played by Kaylee Spenny from uh, Priscilla and nice. the soon to be alien film directed by Fede Alvarez later great this year. Priscilla. Right. And she's in this. And, and the thing is about Kaylee Spenny is that she's actually like 23 and her character in this is meant to be 23, but she looks about 14. <laughs> and this kind of youthful, so you have this very young, timid, youthful presence amidst all this kind of very adult conflict. And um, quickly, uh, early on, Kirsten Dunst and Wagner Moore revealed to their journalist colleague, they say, we're actually planning to drive to DC because the front line is being pushed back and they're like, we want to, she wants to get a photo of the president and he wants to get an interview with the president before they believe the Western forces are going to get to the president and they're going to execute him. You know, the film is very much informed by like, um, the, the, kind of, a kind of like dictatorships. You know, they talk about Gaddafi, they talk about Saddam, they talk about Ceausescu. It's like, this is very much informed by actual history. So they are planning to embark on a road trip to drive to DC through, which gets them very close to the front line. Their elder, their, um, Steve McKenney Henderson asked to come along, even though he's a, a walking risk. He's incredibly slow. He's older. He, you know, he, he, putting him in a combat situation is not advised. And who also gets themselves onto this trip is Kaylee Spenny's budding journalist. And the four of them are this kind of ragtag team who then drive in a press van through the altered United States, a civil um, a United States that is in the throes of the titular civil war as they head themselves to DC. It's a road movie, basically. Okay. So as I said before, the first thing to say about Civil War, whatever you think about it, it is not the film you think it is. Like I said, it is much more focused on journalism. The Civil War of the title, the Civil War that's being really billed to you and marketed to you is very much background. It, it, the Civil War to this movie is what the monsters are to Gareth Edwards' monsters. If anyone ever yeah. saw that movie, it's like very much in the background, but that's actually about like a you know, escaping from Mexico and uh, um, like a relationship between two people. And that's kind of what's happening here. Beautifully shot. And you have um, moments and recreations of this kind of altered America. It, it looks like present day, although there's one line that makes you think it could be set 10, 15 years in the future. So the film it, it is about um, journalism and, and the, the pursuit of truth and the validity of that, and this kind of, specifically with photojournalism, walking this line of being, uh, of objective reportage, and also adrenaline thrill-seeking. Are you being complicit in perpetuating people's obsession with war? And there's kind of, you could do kind of a deeper reading about America's obsession with military, with war, with guns, with um, power, 
Um, and, and, and are you, as a photojournalist, fetishizing war? Are you aestheticizing it? Are you getting a little thrill out of it? Are you getting addicted to it? Um, and you do kind of have this kind of waning, waxing, waning parallel between Kaylee Spenny's character as she kind of assumes more and more and gets sucked into the photojournalism more while Kirsten Dutz is becoming more and more embittered by it. Um, the, the recreation of, of um, you know, the, 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 any scenes of sort of action and war are actually quite few and far between, but the moments of war photography that are recreated. So for example, you'll see them take a shot and then it'll show you the shot that they've just taken, the black right. and white photography is very evocative and, and, and very startling. You and I both like photography. And as we were just saying with Ripley, like the, the recreation of the black and white war photography in this is really startling. You know, if anyone knows the work of like Don McCullen, this is really informed by that. And that's quite interesting to see. Um, I, I think I, th I think I should probably just say I was I was quite underwhelmed by Civil War actually I was disappointed which is a real shame because I think it's got really good ingredients and it's made by directors who's made some interesting work and I'm, I'm starting to get the impression Alex Garland makes um, you know makes writes and directs movies around an interesting concept but always doesn't quite la stick the landing with them so mm. with a film like Men for me the two the first two thirds work quite well as yeah. a kind of uh, a thriller um, uh, as a horror film but then it completely just goes crazy in the third act yeah. and any sort of like deeper level about men or uh, women versus men i think is really kind of not bad title me. for that film i bad think, title I think it, 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 it invites more questions than the film i think needs to answer and that's exactly what's happening here right. i think calling it civil war invites you to think that it's about polarized America. And when I first saw this coming out, I thought, well, actually, that's got its finger on the pulse. Uh, actually, it's a bit too much. It's probably got, it's, um, it's quite on the nose, calling it civil war. America is incredibly divided at the moment. It's incredibly politicized, incredibly polarized. And I thought, okay, here comes a film that's going to imagine the extension yeah. of that in a the few years' common time. Common narratives that we're heading towards the civil war. It's right, about the insurrection of the White House, like following that. Exactly. Right. Very pointed title. And I think, I actually, this film sidesteps that. And I actually, one half of me, I do respect their decision to do that because it, that is such a minefield and is such a dangerous line to walk that I understand if they go, you know, we're actually going to put that in the background or we're actually going to focus on these characters in the foreground. But the problem is you do feel a little bit teased because you've been invited to a film called Civil War. You think mm. you're going to see a film that's really going to tackle this issue in a time that's about America being so polarised. And it's like, yeah, it's in the background. I mean, I've seen people comment on this film and say, oh, it's a film that really like, grabs you and asks the important questions and doesn't let go. And I'm like, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I don't actually think that. So, so that's the first thing. I don't, it's, not it's not really about Civil War. That's very much in the background. And it's not about polarised America as much as it really should be for a film called Civil War in, a, in an era when America is not too far away from something like Civil War. Um, there are moments, there are horrific moments and horrific images. And like I said, anyone familiar with war photography, they won't be surprised. But I think one of the biggest problems is, is that it doesn't, it doesn't make me think. There's nothing in this film that actually made me think. There's nothing that made me feel deeply uncomfortable or got under my skin. When you're watching something like this, again, that should be close to the mark and have its finger on the pulse, you should feel uncomfortable. You should feel knotty. You should feel a little bit sweaty. And it doesn't do that. There's nothing shocking in this film that isn't on the news every day. There's, there, I'm so, so depressing. I mean, I'm really sorry to say, but there, there is stuff on the news every day that is much more shocking and thought provoking and, and, and horrific than what's going on in Civil War. Um, and actually, sorry, just to finish my point, I just mentioned about Alex Garland. It's like, so, so men, like two, two first two thirds of Jim Falls Bar, Annihilation, here and there, great sort of last half an hour, I think. Yeah. And, and with Civil War, it's a whole structure, I would say. I think the first two thirds are fairly mm, humdrum. I will, well, I'll get on to say this, but I think the third act kind of picks it up a little bit. Ex Machina is a film that I think- he's, Yes, I think that's- his, his best film, and I think- I agree. Consistently good all the way through. <laughs> um, I think it's observations- are fairly pedestrian. I think it's 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 not really like I said. Getting there's not a lot of depth to it as much as you would expect or want for a film like this. And like I said, go on the news every day, you'll get much more than this film is, is giving you. I actually think there's a comparison to make with a really good. Uh, I think it was a Colombian film from five years ago called Monos. Mm. Now Monos is fairly similar because that imagined a hypothetical civil war in an unnamed South American country, although clearly very much informed by Colombia. And it was about a group of child soldiers up in the mountains. And even though that was about a fictional civil war, um, 
that film did really well at making you feel uncomfortable because of the because because of the age of the children that you know that they were dealing with and about the dynamics and effects of war and i think that was a much better thought exercise and an aesthetic exercise i mean monos is a really really good film but i'm like that was a better imagination and exploration of a hypothetical civil war than this film does um you know, like I said, great great moments here and there, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, passingly, um, it has a quite annoying use of upbeat pop music to horrific imagery, uh, and I'm a bit like, we have seen that many, many times. Alex, yeah. come on, is that the best we can do? Um, the third act is great. Uh, is, is is much better. It, that the third act really ramps up the action, the tension, and the kind of the stakes, and is very, very heavily informed like I kind of said earlier, by history, and you kind of do feel like what you're watching here, history in in motion. But I can't say that it, it, it delivers a punch at the end that really that makes me go, oh, wow. Again, it doesn't it doesn't make you think, this film. That, that's the biggest problem. It doesn't make you think. Mm. You might go, oh, that's passingly interesting. There's a moment here or there. Um, and the, some of the action is, is very sort of taut and tense. But um, I, I was quite underwhelmed with it. Um, in that respect. So, so not the film you think it is, not that deep, doesn't make you think, everything on the news is scarier than what's going on in this. And third act is better and kind of makes it a little bit worthwhile. It kind of saves the film, I think, the third act. But yeah, I was, I was disappointed. I almost feel like when, yeah, calling your film Civil War and mm. like Civil War, mm. and the, is, I, I do go in there thinking you've created a really hard problem to solve yes, or answer. Pitch yourself into a corner. I'm not saying yeah. you have to do that when you make that film, but almost you're inviting a lot of, given that like, I don't know how you want, what, what incident you want to call an American news that you're relating that to and want clearly yeah. trying to draw from. It's making it very difficult for you to make a statement without diverting from it. And therefore, mm. as you said, feeling like you were slightly teased or misdirected towards what this film's saying. But, I, mean, um, they're, I mean, they're putting this film in IMAX. They're like, yeah, go see yeah, Civil War. Right. I'm like, I think, again, that's misleading people that they're going to see Apocalypse Now. They're not. Yeah. Because I think they just think, oh, big film, shot big with with action. We can make a few extra bucks on this cinema ticket. I, I still stand by, like, I, I like, I really like yes. the mind of Alex Garland. And as you said, I, I agree yeah. with you on all the films you said where the landing wasn't quite stuck. But um, he has a really sort of dark and slightly twisted way of looking at the world. And I will go and see the film because he's a bit of a draw for me. But yeah, I, I, I did have that. I don't really know where to place this from the marketing. And I've heard mixed things from mm. different people. I will say, I'm still glad this film got made and this film exists. Because ultimately, you know, I know it's A24. You can't almost really call them an independent company anymore. They're so yeah. big. Yeah. But I am still, I'm still a, a grateful for the fact that a sort of... Uh, you know, a director, an independent director can make a movie that tries to tackle a bigger thing. Original IP. IP, Exactly. All of those things for what's probably a modest budget. Yeah. I'm I'm still happy that that exists. It's got a kind of very um, 1970s American new wave kind of feel about it. I'm I'm, I'm happy for that. But I think, I think people will be disappointed. (sighs) Got, um, Husband, wife duo, Jesse Plemons, Kirsten Dunst. Not much Jesse Plemons. I'm just going to say that now oh, as well. It's not. It's not a Jesse Plemons movie. Oh, it's a Kirsten Dunst movie. He's my favorite. He, 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 he's good yeah. everything. He's in it like like he's, he's like with Nick Offerman and Jesse Plemons. You know what I'm yeah, saying? So yeah, fine. Okay. Well, yeah. I will uh, be interested to see what you guys think of it because as we said, there's lots of different uh, opinions out there. So as always, if you wanted to send them in, if you agree or disagree with George or just had different thoughts, questions, concerns, send them into hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. We will read them out on the show. Maybe we'll read them out when I go and see it, and maybe in a yeah, week. Yeah, that's it. We can actually two, talk can, about we it. We can comment on I, it and get other people to I'd, I'd chime l- in. I'd love it to provoke more of a conversation. This film, but I. I really yeah. i also like I'm, I'm a pretty good read of how the rest of an audience feels about something yeah. and i think the audience felt a bit like me just sat in kind of bemused silence being like okay yeah okay that was the film mm. also alex garland i mean i know he's just said that he, he probably won't make any more films he did sound very depressed really? when he got on stage he was like yep um thanks for to this thing where's he's, um, he's very subdued he, maybe that's it. Maybe he's playing it cool. Yeah. But again, it, like I say, Alex Scott, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I, I wish you would make more films. I'm still happy for you to be making yeah, yeah. films. And Men only came out not that long ago to have done this. And- yes, because they got the, he wrote the script for this pre-COVID. He sent sure, it to the producers yeah. February 2020. It's quite a fast so turnaround. Also, and this is the other thing. I'm wondering if for a, finger, for a film to have its finger on the pulse, it kind of dates. Because if this film was written pre, pre-January 6th, yeah. Insurrection... <laughs> yeah. 
uh, yeah, now it's just got so, so much. True. And coming, I'm sure coming out in changed. an election year as well, it's just it's probably why it got commissioned. It's very easy to sell. That's the thing. It's a bit of a if it's a bit of a bait and switch. This movie. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let us know what you think. George, should we go through some of the emails that we get sent into the show Absolutely. every single week? If you guys want to send in your reviews, your thoughts, your questions, your concerns, you can, of course, send them in to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Just like Noreen did. Noreen writes in and says, hello. First off, let me say, I'm a huge fan of the podcast. Listen every week and glad I discovered Pop Kitchen last year. Keep up the good work. I'm writing this immediately after listening to your review of Monkey Man, which I just saw this evening. Please go and check out George's review from last week. Witnessing this project... Uh, witnessing this project from Dev Patel has made me so proud to be a fellow South Asian and I can't wait to see what he does in the future. Brackets, petition for Dev Patel to be James Bond if it doesn't work out with Aaron Taylor Johnson. Oh, that's not bad. Would that yeah, work? Is he, he, is he... He's handsome. He's yeah. young. He's at that level of fame. But, he, 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 but he's doing his own stuff now. Like, you can own your own work. Why be... Why be... He's just done his own James Bond. Yeah. Yeah. I was gripped from start to finish with Monkey Man, from the story of revenge to the cinematography and the way the camera would focus solely on his face so you could see the intensity of his emotion. A couple of my favourite scenes was the massive brawl in the brothel to the tune of Bollywood song Ooh La La, which is from The Dirty Picture, which is a biographical film about an Indian actress noted for her erotic roles. Iconic. And also the scene where Dev Patel's character is training with the boxing bag mm -hmm. to the man playing tabla. Mm. Going into the film, I was aware that there would be subtle nods to the current Indian political climate and Modi's leadership and his treatment to minorities in India. Oh. I'd heard that the Netflix release didn't happen because of the satire approach to Indian politics and wonder what the original edit may have been like before Jordan Peele got on board. One thing I also spotted was in the Bougie Club, which had portraits of Indian Maharajas. There was a particular focus on Maharaja Duleep Singer, whose life, uh, whose life is too much to go into. In short, he took the throne at the age of five, befriended Queen Victoria, converted, to Sikhism, converted from Sikhism to Christianity and was the last to process the Kohinoor diamond after Britain took possession of it after a war between the Sikhs and Britain. I wonder if this focus on Duleep Singer was deliberate, especially when it comes to Sikh Sirens on our end, especially when it comes to Sikhs as a minority in India and the farmer protests in the Punjab region. Uh, just before I go on, I cannot speak on that, but thank you so yes. much for filling thank in you very all much. of that yeah. history. Again, we, we yeah, we can't speak, that's I great. can't comment on that, but because, that's yeah. great to know. So, so interesting to know. Uh, also, it goes on to say, also interesting to know, as the assumption was that it was filmed in Mumbai, but after sticking around for the credits until the end, Monkey Man was actually filmed in Indonesia. Finally, as I write this from Adelaide, Australia, where Dev Patel has become an honorary Adelaidean, as he spends a lot of his time here, I hope he gets his flowers for this film. And thanks again for Pop Kitchen as someone who makes an effort to go to the cinema usually twice a week. The podcast is a great companion and quickly become my number one film podcast, Noreen. Thank you for that email, Thank Noreen. you, Noreen. Very in-depth. And, yeah. and you're helping, you know, substantiate elements that we, we aren't able to comment on ourselves. So I really appreciate that. Was that was great. A um, little, bit, little bit of history for you there. If, if that, Diamonds and kings and emperors of Queen Victoria. If, that's, if that is all in there, then great for Dev Patel. Fantastic. So that in. Um, another email about Monkey Man is from Robert who says, hello, I have both of yous, I hope both of yous are doing well another irish listener do you think probably yeah um long time listener viewer it, slash me. viewer of the podcast and i've thought about writing in plenty of times but never thought what to say until now i thought george's review of monkey man was great and was pretty spot on i saw monkey man a few days early and really enjoyed it it's chaotic and has such high energy with an artistic and visual style to which i thought dev delivers really really well the camera work is camera work is probably the highlight for me some of the shots were amazing and the camera in those fight scenes is always moving which sometimes i thought patel was just doing too much and took it a little too far because it all became a little bit distracting for me because i wish he'd just stopped kept the camera still for once yeah there's a few times i'm just like just stop taking the camera please it is a fine balance to try yeah. to make that work can we have three less shakes in this scene please yeah. um also i'd probably say monkey man is closer to jordan peele's brand of open-ended allegorical political cinema but what Patel does well is use the aesthetic and, na and the narrative to showcase the divide between people of different classes. Hey, very good. Mm -hmm. right now, I know George really likes the talented Mr. Ripley, so does James. Uh, and so does I, says Robert. And I was just curious to know if you'd be watching the TV series Ripley. Well, you were in the right episode, Robert, because we just reviewed it. There you there go. You anyway, lads, don't, you don't have to read all of this. Love the pod. Keep it up. Have a good one, Rob. Uh, this next last bit about Monkey Man is from Nick, who writes, a friend of the show, Nick, says, Greetings, gentlemen. I saw Monkey Man last evening and I did enjoy the film, but I do feel like the direction and style grew with Dev Patel's character. As Kid is getting overpowered in fights at the beginning, I feel the direction sometimes comes across as a bit all over the place, but as the character learns to fight, Dev Patel really 
really stands out as a director. The fights feel more slick and less close up and shaky, but overall quite enjoyable. Also, my friend and I, my friends and I coined a new term for the latest trend in films, which is applicable to Monkey Man and Love Lies Bleeding, which is going full A24. Even though Monkey Man is not a A24 movie. Yeah, I guess it's like that scorched neon, yeah. high production value, but more intimate thematic story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you all quality you want to go on it. Uh, an interesting and grounded story. It goes on to say, an interesting and grounded story, but then going overly surreal and often supernatural. How do we feel mm. about this? Keep up the good work from your self-appointed Australian correspondent, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Um, there is a, there is definitely a quality to them and yeah, it's style. Like, it's like it's like mid-budget movie, small mid-budget movie that's amped up, artistically inclined. It's kind big of big budget. It's yeah, artistically inclined, but given steroids. I mean, literally yeah. in the case of Love Lies Bleeding. Yeah, yeah I mean, Monkey Man doesn't. Do the sort of doesn't doesn't delve into surreal and supernatural in the way that Love Love Lies Bleeding just goes off on. I mean, look, I'm interested to see when you see that. For, I, I assume you're going to see it. Will you? Love Lies Bleeding. Yeah. yeah, I would like to. Yeah, yeah I saw a trailer for it yesterday. Yeah, I'm interested to know what you, you think about it. But um, but yeah, that go, that goes off on one. Um, thank Josh. you, Nick. This next email now from Josh is Hi James and George or George and James. I'm Josh, a fairly new listener and a first time email. Welcome, welcome to the show. My local cinema is a very historic one. Oh. The Curzon in Clevedon, not far from Bristol. Nice. Not related to the Curzon cinema chain. Oh, okay. oh. It's been running since 1912. Whoa. And it's absolutely gorgeous to, to be in, despite only having one small screen and showing the variety of films, and, and not showing the variety of films you can expect at the other cinemas. Fine. I feel very lucky to have such a cool place of UK cinema history near me. My question is whether you've ever visited any historic cinemas or places of film interest and whether you think it's worth sacrificing the quality of the sound and the screen, etc., mm. for a brilliant venue. As much as I love it, I am looking forward to moving out for uni in Oxford and being able to see a wider range of yeah. films. <laughs> yeah. Love the pod and spend most of my time adding the films you recommend to my ever-growing watch list nice. and I hope they'll be coming up on streaming soon. So James... Uh, have you ever visited any historic, historic cinemas or places of film interest? I mean, like outside of the Prince Charles, which is old, but I can't say I've visited loads of really Did old cinemas. Did you ever go to the Duke of York's cinema in Brighton when we were there? I don't know. Near me. Oh, yes, I did. I did. Not, yeah. not the one in the lanes, not the Comedia one. The one in uh, the, one, the Duke of York's really old. It's like an old picture house. I'm going to say no. Oh, Okay. Not, okay, well, that, that that would be my answer. Yeah. I don't. I, I that got hit hard by COVID. I just want to check oh, if it's shame. still uh, Duke of York's Brighton. Oh, good, it is still. Open. The Duke of York's Picture House in Brighton is a very old picture house, and uh, I saw good things for you there. And and the sound and stuff was good there. I, I like that. The Castle Cinema in Homerton I went to recently. That's really nice. Very old, sort of like proscenium arch style, uh, loungy seats. I saw uh, Infinity Pool there. Oh yeah, which was you know boutiquey boutiquey. Are you, have you ever been to the Electric Cinema in Notting Hill? That's what I'm just going to look up here, which it looks gorgeous inside. I've never been to. No, but I know of it. I'm just going to show you. I was there recently, outside on the street. I'm going to show you a picture of it, James. I was watching. It's like proper yeah, artist, yeah. you know. Lovely. Uh, so that's probably it for our, art, uh, for our, for our answers. I mean, have, have oh. you ever been to any like film locations? Like, uh, you know, film, fil oh, this is historically significant because such and such was filmed here. Oh, probably but not off the top of your head. I mean, like, yeah, but nothing that's like, nothing remarkable. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Moving on. Thank you. Um, whoop. Next email is James. from James. He writes into the show and says, Hi both. I was looking for James Acaster impressions, was recommended your podcast, which didn't disappoint, and ended up sticking around for the great film chat. Hey. With an imminent relocation to the, from the UK to Canada on the horizon for me and my family, I was wondering if you had any recommendations for films set there. I know it's massive, but anywhere within Canada will do. Looking to drum up excitement for my wife and kids who are less thrilled and slightly apprehensive about the move at the moment. Keep up the great work, James. Well, we have some Canadian listeners. And in fact, if, if there are yeah. any Canadian listeners listening right now, please email in great films about Canada. Yeah. I can't, I, I've got two in my head. head. I've got, go on. Isn't, is Goon with Sean William Scott and Jay Baruchel, is that? <laughs> must be. I assume because it's about must ice be. hockey, it must yeah. be Canadian. Um, Blackberry is a Canadian film. It's set in Waterloo in Canada. That, that was a Canadian company with a Canadian story. Nice. Blackberry, I would say. I hear um, the film we haven't seen, Also Indeed and Evil Nerves is, is oh, yeah, set in Canada. Is that something? Quebec? Yeah, it must be French yeah. Canada. Yeah. French Canadia. French Canadia. Um, is there anything John, else? Hi. Canada. 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 Oh, um, uh, South Park, Bigger, Longer and Uncut. <laughs> A big, big calendar, Canada scene in there. Is it in the Simpsons movie? They moved to Alaska, not Canada. It's Alaska, isn't it? Yeah. I've only seen. I, on. I've been given loads of films that are filmed in Canada or have Canadian actors in, 
But I mean, oh, like, what, I mean, like, what is wrong with Google? All Quiet on the Western Front is not a Canadian <laughs> film, okay? Like, come on. Anyway, <laughs> there must have been one thing they did in Canada that Google's like, yeah, well, this. Uh, something. <laughs> this next email. Oh, also, good luck with the move to Canada, by the way. On, yeah, on that one. Yeah, Fargo almost. <laughs> Fargo's yeah, it's, yeah, close. Like Montana, isn't it? I think Minnesota. It's Minnesota. Yeah. That's it. Right, it's the other side. Yeah. Um, A stone's or, I'll tell you what you can do. Bruce Almighty, because he goes to Niagara Falls, which yeah. is the, on, on the, the border line. with on the line. Line. Um, Next email. Back is, to you, fuckers. Next email is. By the way, I would say our show has a 12A rating, and that we yeah. swear once. Get one. You get, get one, one F word. Yeah. Um, Kids, fine. Kids are fine. Yeah. Isaac Roberts says, hi guys, brand new to this podcast. And I'm so happy I found it as I was literally trying to find this exact style of podcast for films. Well, you came to the right place. I just listened to episode 121 and I absolutely love the answer to if the podcast had changed your love of films. Mm. Saying that going to the cinema is surrendering yourself to the cinema's rules and time scale is practically poetry. Loved every bit. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Well, I should probably clip that and put it on social media. Yeah. However, my question is, you said how everyone must follow the cinema rules and be quiet. Well, what is the most annoying thing you've experienced in the cinema with other people and how do you handle it? For example, I hate people on their phone with a bright light. Yeah, oh, fine. me too. I solve this by shooting popcorn kernels at them through my straw. Uh, only if it's getting out of hand and super distracting. Again, love the podcast and I'm listening to you every one day by day. Thanks, Isaac. First of all, Great way of handling it, shooting popcorn at them if they've yeah, got their phone out. Yeah, um, yeah f- phone brightness it has almost superseded talking in, yeah. in the cinema now. A slight murmuring, I always have to take, take but, but, but a bright light. And like for, on <sighs> maximum brightness. The phones, the phones get bright, brighter every year as well. I told, I told the story before on the show, but we, when James and I went to see Avengers Endgame five years ago, yeah. we were at the top, top, top of this cinema. And which got, subjects you to more, depth, the ch- higher yes. chance of which seeing people with phones. Which is why when I typically choose my seats in the cinema, I go, yeah, yeah, I want to be away from people. Yeah. I'd happily even go like row B. Just even if I have to crane my neck. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to know that I'm with other people in the room. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there was a guy in row B, mm. full left. brightness, yeah. full brightness. We could all sit. And James, to his credit, got up, walked all the way down the stairs, went up to the guy and was, what did you say? What did you say? I was like, can you turn your phone screen down? It's really distracting. Yeah, and he did. He turned And then I, I have this way of like, I'll say something really clear, short and definitive, and then just stare at them. <laughs> and then I'll leave. You know, you just linger. Yeah. Just like, feel it's really distracting. Um, I mean, and then I leave. Yes, but in my head, what's really annoying, and I, I, it's probably really toxic. I have like a three strikes and you're getting spoken to rule. Yeah. So like, if I so if they're behind me, oh, yeah, they get they get look. What's, what's going? Something must be happening for you yeah. to be talking. And then you get the second strike is prolonged look, and I wait for eye contact. Yeah. And then I turn around when nice, I get eye contact. Nice. And then the third one is uh, I'll go and say something. What do you say? I would I would just go. So see, I I didn't. We probably had this differently. I would yeah. say, sorry guys, do you mind? Because yeah, yeah. you, you sound almost polite. Yeah. But you're being, you're being, you're saying Classic sorry. Britain start with yeah, a sorry. So, so, yeah. Sorry guys, do you mind? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've had um, on my row, I've had a, a father and a son. Uh, the son is talking a lot, which I'm quite forgiving of, but the dad is like indulging it and talking Ugh. and all of this stuff. And I've had to, you know, I'm not talking to the kid. I'm talking to How was like, the kid? I want to say nine, ten. Right. Like not so young, but like kind of, I think old enough to be sat to, to quietly better. and still yeah. at the cinema. And it's just been like long times and I've made eye contact and then I'll be like, oh, I went over, I was like, hi, you guys are being really loud. I'm trying to watch the film. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it totally, it totally solves it. A lot of people, uh, you know, do, do, some people might tell you to F off. I mean, that's not like that's happened, but some people are going to be loud regardless. I think also one thing I wish I'd done one time is move. Don't be afraid to move yeah. seats, especially if you're in a half empty cinema. And it, it becomes less about like, should you or shouldn't you? It's more that I am like completely out of this film now yeah. because all I can hear is the talking or all I can see is the phone screen. Yeah. And like, you, you're, I've paid money and taken myself out I to, think, to, to yeah. get that experience where I'm in the black box. I think also it's like, what's annoying is if someone's on their phone screen like eight rows down in the middle and you can't get to them like you could yeah. with that person. But I think it's like, it's like if you need the loo in the middle of a film, if you just sit and think and try and ignore yeah. it, it's going to distract yeah. you because your brain's going to be thinking, you either go and deal with it. Last night I had that. Yeah. JP. yeah. You're like, you either go and deal with it and, and just tell them and you'll probably feel better about it. And then you won't yeah. be just distracted. I also think that what sometimes people get embarrassed. They think they're just talking at normal life. If you go over and go, guys, could you stop talking? Yeah. They're going to get so embarrassed because yeah. they, they, feel, they feel like all, their, all the eyes are on them. The worst one was teenage girls taking flash selfies oh my of God. themselves in the seat. They were like, in a similar to the end game one, they were like sitting right at the front. I just couldn't believe 
yeah. that they thought, they're like 15, 16, that they thought it's okay or funny to like turn your phone and flash. And that to be like, I, that was, I was like, guys, like, what are you doing? You're taking yeah. flash photos. It's really distracting. When I saw and Incredibles. I held eye contact. <laughs> Yeah. Like that. <laughs> nice, no, that's the yeah. way to do it. When I saw Incredibles 2, yeah. n- nothing to do, but just uh, two young toddlers just running, screaming around the front. Oh, yeah, terrible. Like, this isn't, this, you can't use this no. as a way of just dumping your children to. No. You know, and there are all those um, kid friendly like, screenings where you can take like babies' infants, but that's, that's, yeah. not what this, that's not what this is. It's not frozen with the sing, sing along. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyway. But yeah, don't be afraid if you need to tell people to be quiet, just go up to them. Most people will, will be shocked and quietened down. Yeah. Also, and just like also, know, know really clearly being, what the rules are. Also, and, if someone also does turn around and give you give you hell for it, makes you, you can go and get a member of staff then. Yeah. And it's their job to show up. Cool. You can. Why? It just, no, sorry, just on that, just when people are that badly behaved and stuff, I'm just like, why have you come? Yeah. Why have you come? Why are you spending your money here? What are you doing? Yeah. Go watch it at home. And it's like, obviously, people can talk and things happen and people open crisps. And I'm not saying you, you, you react to everything, yeah. but like, I, I am aware of who is consistently really pissing me off. I was really happy at my screening of Monkey Man because, first of all, it was a very well behaved audience. But the guy, the people behind me, this couple, they were, um, they were chatting away before the film started, even a bit through the trailers. That's absolutely fine. And then, like all good cinema goers, as soon as the film started, not a peep. Yeah, not a peep. Like, you, you know, we went to see June Part Two. Big, full IMAX yeah. screening. Lots of energy after work. Yeah. Drinks. Everyone's buzzing. But once the film, it's all like a, I think a very sort of uh, knowledgeable, frequent cinema attending yeah. crowd. And as soon as the film started, it was silent. Yeah, laughter when it was funny. But no, there's no, there's no problems there. Yeah. <sighs> Anyway, anyway, sorry, <laughs> bit of a tangent. <laughs> a tangent bit of a rat. Watch out for us because we're out there. Um, you gonna once somebody's gonna be in a cinema, they're gonna look up and just see you <laughs> staring just, at them. <laughs> have you seen that meme, which is the the ostrich with its head tilted? Oh, no, no, and no, it's yeah, like yeah. when the teacher, when you've been talking and the teacher catches your eye. That's that's me at the cinema. Um, but anyway, uh, those are the emails. Thank you so much Thank for you. writing them in. As always, if you wanted to send in your reviews, your thoughts, your emails, your questions, your concerns. Send them into hello at popculturepodcast.com and we'll read them out on next week's episode. Should we play a game? I'd love to. Thank you. All right, George, as always, let's end... With a game. With a game. I've got two games for you. I've got a... How many rounds? Name. You've got one round of each game. Got it. <laughs> that was on to you. Uh, you got one uh, round of name three in six seconds. Okay. George is going to be presented with a uh, a brief and he's got a name with three yeah. of the films or characters or pieces and within six seconds. And the next one is a classic favourite, uh, opposite film titles. Gotcha. Good love fun. It. Gotta love them. Right, are you ready for your name three and six round? <laughs> well, well, Please feel free Sha, sha let's warm up, warm up the brain cells. So if I said, for example, I'd be George, name me three Richard Gere films, you would say. Uh, Pretty Woman. Arbitrage, yeah, and the Runaway Jury is he in that? Runaway Bride, nice. That would be correct. Right, George, are you ready? Let's do it. Please play along at home. <sighs> Name me three Jennifer Aniston movies. Along came Polly. We are the Millers. Yeah, and Wanderlust. Yes. Name three films where a character eats dessert. Inglorious Bastards. Yes. The Matrix Revolutions. Yeah, uh, t- reloaded. No, no, no well, short, sure. yeah. Merovingian. And for that delay, we're going to have to refer to Chocolat. Yeah, very good. I had two of those same ones. Uh, name three Marvel films that have yet to be released. Deadpool 3. Yeah. Fantastic Four. Yes. And Avengers Secret Wars. Sure. Uh, name three Jason Alexander movies. Jace, uh, Shallow Hal. Yes. <laughs> Pretty Woman. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, he's got to be the voice in something, hasn't he? <laughs> yes. Oh, the voice in. No, not out of time. Oh. They've three films that released in 2020. That actually came out in 2020. Yes. Um, uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Yeah. Um, the Vast of Night. <laughs> and Wonder Woman 1984. I believe you. Uh, name three characters that died and came back to life. Ever. Uh, M- Matrix Neo. Mat- N- Matrix One Neo. Yes. Um, the Passion of the Christ. No, I don't. <laughs> I'll count um, it. <laughs> and uh, that's probably time. Huge Wolverine. Logan. Yes, Deadpool. 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 Deadpool's a good one. Yeah, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. <laughs> um, so that's the where characters eat dessert. I put Ignorous Bastards. The cake is Matrix Reloaded. No, is that the one where he, the Merovingians Reloaded? 
I'm sure. Is that when they go to the restaurant? And he's yeah, like, that is Matrix okay, Two. Okay, I'm I'm guaranteeing that's Matrix Three. I'll bet you 100 percent it's Matrix Two. What's 100 100 percent of what? I, I remember just really it know it's they... Matrix Two because the that scene, the following scene from that is the highway chase. No, the following the scene for the highway chase is the fight in the chateau. It's it's right. Matrix Two. Yeah, Google it. Merovingian cake scene is Matrix Two. Brilliant scene. It's reloaded. This scene. Right? This scene here, right? Yeah? Yes. Right? Matrix reloaded. Um, yeah, it's Matrix reloaded, isn't it? That's all right. Yeah, it's Matrix just, reloaded. Just, just, I'm really confident it's Matrix reloaded. Because no, ah, no. the fight in the Merovingian's mansion, the whole chateau thing, is his place. And then he kisses Monica Bellucci afterwards because she thinks he's fit. She wants, she wants the taste of her lips of love on hers. It's so hot. Okay, I just, okay, we need to get to the bottom of this. Just it's bear Matrix with me. Reloaded. People at home are screaming Matrix Reloaded. Oh, yeah, it's, all right, it's Reloaded. Thank fair you. enough, fair enough. Thank I don't you. know why part of my brain had put that in revolutions right. in my head. Sorry. Sorry. So, anyhow, so yeah, you would got, um, I did Inglorious Bastards, yes. Matrix Reloaded, and then my third option was Matilda, the Boost Bog Trotter cake. Ah, uh, okay. So that's quite a that's famous one. That's right. I said chocolate. I'm pretty sure there's dessert There must in be. Yeah, it's chocolate. Surely. That counts. Yeah. yeah, and then I was thinking you could order a safe bet as chef they must eat dessert somewhere in that film, but I can't remember exactly Wonka, what. Wonka, Willy Wonka. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, Wonka, yeah, well, there you go. Uh, name three Marvel films yet to be released. You got them, I put, there's Captain America Brave New World, Fantastic Four, and what Avengers, a, and Deadpool. Uh, three Jason Alexander movies, it's quite hard. So you got my, my two, which is Shallow Hal and Pretty Woman, and then my voice of is he voices one of the gargoyles in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, oh, goodness. which I only Come know on. because I rewatched that recently. <laughs> Strangely dark film. Never, Hunchback. Seen Hunchback. Never seen it. It's deeply inappropriate Where to be it? a child's film. It's so strange. Oh, wow. If you know, you know. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, three films that released in 2020. That's yeah. quite hard okay. to do. So um, I know Portrait, Portrait of a Lady on Fire because I saw it at the cinema. Yeah. I should have said Tenet. That would have been a good ah, one. So Tenet's on my okay. list. Um, I said The Vast of Night because it came out on Prime and I remember watching it in lockdown. Yeah. And the other one I said, come on, was uh, another one. Well, I, I, I got I that one. I what you said. I just one I hadn't heard of maybe. But anyway, I put, so Tenet's the big one, famously, that released in 2020. Oh, Wonder um, Woman 1984. That did come out oh, in December yeah. that year. Uh, there's Trial of the Chicago 7. Oh, yes. Out. That's great. Yes. Really love that film. Uh, Greyhound with Tom Hanks. Yes, I saw Plus. that as well, yeah. Uh, the Invisible Man with Elizabeth. Yes. What's Mom's face? Seen it, but I heard that was really good. Yeah, I've not seen it. it. I've not seen it. Uh, the Courier with Benedict Cumberbatch and Kira Knightley that was really forgotten about. And I know it came out in 2020 because lockdown happened and there were posters all over the tube uh, for that film. And nobody was replacing the tube posters because nobody wanted to pay money to advertise on yeah. the tube because no one was using it. And for like a year and a half, you saw posters oh, wow. for The Courier, which had been out 18 months ago. I'm like, oh God, the advertising's not being replaced. Um, yeah, and another round with Mads Mikkelsen, which I've heard really good things oh, about, yeah. but I haven't yeah. seen. Uh, three characters that died and came back to life. Uh, Superman in the recent Justice League. Sure, yeah. Uh, Trinity and Neo in the Matrix yes, both count. Um, uh, Jesus. The, the Jesus Christ, obviously. Uh, obviously all the characters in Marvel, but I would have only accepted one. Sure. Um, Harry Potter. Sure. Ray. The boy who lived. Yeah, come to die. Yeah, so there That's you go. Great. Very well done. Final one. This is for movie, uh, opposites. movie opposites. Great fun. I'm going to give George the opposite movie title, the antonyms of the words, and George has to tell me in quick fire what film I am talking about. George, are you ready? Sure. You have to guess the film from its opposite film title. Tame, Tame East. Tame, Tame East West. Uh, tame, Tame East. Something, Something West. Something, Something West. Tame, harsh, harsh West. Uh, wild, wild West. Uh, the moon is sufficient. The world is not enough. We've definitely had that one before. Peace of the moons. War of the worlds. Yes. Chocolate earth. Chocolate earth, sun. Sun, chocolate. Chocolate's the opposite of chocolate. Biscuit. <laughs> Chris. Vanilla sky. Uh, the continent. The continent. The country, the national, the international, the, the nation. The island. Uh, virtue town. Virtue Town, Virtue City, Asteroid, no, City, Virtue City, Virtue, Sin City. Yes, the Variable Warrior. The Warrior, Coward. Cow. The Constant Gardener, that's oh. hard. Shame and Fairness. F shame and Fairness. Uh, shame, Pride yes. and Prejudice. Yes. yes, Out of the Calm. Into the... 
blue chaos wild yes the silver protractor the golden compass yeah that's it that's all done they're good oh, yes god it's yes wild ones, especially Definitely. you get wild wild west I, I take, take I'm not walking around with Wild West in my head. <laughs> no, one's Wild 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 Wild. no one's walking around with Wild Wild West. I watched Wild that West film a lot when I was younger. Really? A lot I've only seen years. it once. It's a bit of an enigma for me. Oh, it's, it's famed for being kind of awful. Yeah, but I think yeah, I watched it a lot. I knew I went. I watched. Is that the one that Will Smith turned down to do playing Neo as the Matrix and ended up doing Wild Wild West instead? Oh, did he actually? Oh yeah. wow! Oh, you know, you know, he was offered Neo. No, I didn't know that. Oh, oh. he was offered Neo. That would have been a um, movie. Would have wanted to take it, and then he he he's late. I I don't know if you knew this at the time, but he later had a theory that they were never going to cast two black actors at that film. And he's like, if I had uh, been cast as Neo, they wouldn't Lawrence, have cast Russell Lawrence Fishburne, Fishburne as, as Morpheus. Very sad. Um, so he's like, he's obviously really glad the Matrix is there and it did its thing. But also, um, Will um, Smith was totally in the right space to be cast as Neo yeah. at that moment in time in his career. But obviously, Wiki Wild Wild, Wild West was also made by Barry Sonnenfeld, who made Men in Black. Right. Okay. So, 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 the, so the, he, he was off the back of Men in Black. The success of that. Barry Sonnenfeld used to be a cinematographer, and he si yeah. was the cinematographer on When Harry Met Sally. Oh, oh beautiful film. Absolutely okay. beautiful to look at. Um, but yeah, those are um, those are the films. That's all. That's all she wrote for episode one, that's two, three. One, two, three. That's all she wrote, guys. Thanks for sticking with us. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Rip See you on world. episode four, five, six. Yeah, that'll be, <laughs> that'll be good. Cut. Uh, Cut eight years. No, later. see you guys later this week for some bonus content. We'll, yep. We will be reviewing Scoop, Prince Andrew in and interview thing. The last, no, sorry, the first Omen. The first, the first not the last one. The last yeah, yeah. one is the end one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First Omen, horror film. We've had two horror films recently, Immaculate and Late Night with they, the Devil. Uh, lots of horror films and coming out. First Omen. It's like, it's, like, it's like six months on from Halloween. It's like a six month Halloween thing. <laughs> Someone was like, shit, we've got all these. <laughs> Just put them out, put them out. As ever, all guys, right. email in. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate it. Like, subscribe, share, follow. New episodes every Wednesday. Shout out to the rooftops. Thanks for bearing with us today. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.